What's up, everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Bartender. Today's show is just a great one. We are stoked to have Steve Curtin on the program. If you don't know Steve, today is your lucky day. He's the author of the best-selling book, Delight Your Customers, and is a globally known expert and speaker on customer service management and leadership. He was rated fourth by Global Guru in its annual listing of the top 30 customer service experts in the world. He's worked with companies like Carnival Cruise Line, Napa Auto Parts, and TJ Maxx, and he spent a career in hospitality at Marriott Hotels. His new book is The Revelation Conversation, Inspire Greater Employee Engagement by Connecting to Purpose. And we're going to get all into purpose today. This isn't soft and fluffy. This is about employees and customers, and I think you're going to dig it. So buckle up, TC Beers, grab your favorite cocktail, and let's get right on into it with Steve Curtin on today's TCB. Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender, where we gather some of the best HR and people leaders to discuss what's happening on the people side of business. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. I love it. Well, welcome, everybody. It's Wednesday. It's your favorite day and mine. It's Corporate Bartender Day. It is the 22nd of June, episode number 136. We've been doing it 136 times, and uh, we wow. keep coming back. So I appreciate each and every one of you. Today, today we have a guest. You may have noticed a strange face here amongst the Brady Bunch. Um, we have Steve Curtin. He is the author of the best-selling book, Delight Your Customers, and is a expert and speaker on customer service management and leadership. He was rated fourth by Global Guru in its annual listing of top 30 customer service exports in the world. So he's had a 20 year career. He's worked, he worked at Marriott International. So Lori, as a, as a travel industry professional, uh, he, he knows your pain. I have no doubts about dealing with people in that space, because that can be a challenge. I um, will give you our CEO's email. <laughs> yeah, a lot of pain and a lot of fun. <laughs> lot, lot more fun, more fun, yes. <laughs> He's worked with such companies as Carnival Cruise Lines, Napa Auto Parts, TJ Maxx, and Health One, and he has a brand new book that caught my eye. It's called The Revelation Conversation. That's not what caught my eye. What caught my eye was the second part of the title, inspire greater employee engagement by connecting to purpose. And it just came out at the end of May. So it's brand new. So let's give Steve a warm TCB. Welcome everybody. All right. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Uh, Glad to be here. Eric. Yeah, it's awesome. I am so happy to have you here. We're just going to jump straight on into the conversation because I think there's a lot of really relevant stuff here. Um, you know, we've talked about engagement a lot in, in several different contexts um, with respect to working remote, getting people back in the office, dealing with the great resignation, right? Yeah. Just dealing with all of the curveballs that we've been tossed since, since 2020. Um, you know, we thought, we thought managing engagement was hard in 2019. We didn't know anything at that point in time. We had no idea what we were in for. It's been a juggling act and an, and an ever changing one at that for the last couple of years. Yeah. And as, as HR professionals, we try to stay ahead of it. So your book was really interesting to me, mm-hmm. but before we get into the content and what the book's all about, tell us a little bit about your story. I mean, did you imagine yourself being in this position, doing this thing when you were a little kid? You know, pro- probably not. Um, you know, there's a, a quote, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And I think that <laughs> to a certain extent, we all experience that. Um, I worked my, my professional career was with Marriott Hotels, where I worked in operations, I worked in sales and marketing, I worked in human resources. And I ended my time in training and development uh, in 2006. And then the following year in 2007, I hung out my own shingle and uh, began to you know, apply a lot of the uh, knowledge that I gained while I was at Marriott, um, speaking and consulting and writing on the topic of customer service. What was really interesting, and I didn't really know it at the time, but, you know, of course, and, um, and the attorney on the call 
Um, is that Chuck? Yeah, that's Chuck. Okay. It is, Steve. Uh, yeah, Chuck, knows, you know, probably knows all about, you know, what you learn and what you develop um, is proprietary to the company that you're with. And so as I worked in training and development, instructional designs with corporate headquarters, um, I wrote a lot about customer service. I wrote about customer service for frontline hourly associates. I wrote about customer service for management training programs. But all of what I had um, sort of accumulated there based on Marriott's cultures, uh, Marriott's corporate culture, I should say, their core values, uh, what they stood for in terms of their mission um, was proprietary to Marriott. And so when I went out on my own, I had to really find my own voice, and that took some time. So the book that's behind me, my first book, Delight Your Customers, was written in 2012, uh, five years after I had left the company, and um, really contained you know, my perspective on the topic of customer service apart from what I had learned at Marriott. And then this book is the follow-up, was written you know, years later, it was just published, as you said, in May, and it, um, you know, it, it, it picks up uh, where Delight Your Customers left off. I love it. I love it. So what was the catalyst for you? You know, th there was a big gap between the two books. What made you go, huh, this is a thing I need to focus on and I got something to say. Well, you know, there was a, there was a pandemic, a global pandemic in March of 2020. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it, <laughs> Honestly, that was the impetus. I mean, I had gained a lot. I was writing a lot. You know, I blog regularly. Um, it had, as we said, as we discussed in the pre-show, it was beginning to influence my, the direction of my consulting because, and when I say it, I mean the, the subject matter of book two, because that's where the consulting work was being led um, as a result of the client objectives. That's where it was leading us. And that's in part due to the workforce. It's in part due to many other factors. But I had been working on this. It had been incubating. And then my pivot, we talked about pivot right. in 2020 and 21, uh, 2020 in particular. And as uh, consultants and trainers and speakers were pivoting, for, for instance, to uh, platforms like this one uh, to continue working, or in some cases pivoted to a new job or a new career, um, I pivoted to, to writing. And so I began working, you know, in that spring, um, I actually signed up for a writer's guild to, you know, nice. to fortify my, my own writing. And then I worked on a proposal. I have an agent. We brought that to a, uh, uh, publisher in the fall. The first publisher said, no, we brought it to two more publishers. Um, the third publisher said yes. While the second publisher was thinking about it. <laughs> we got a contract and I spent most of 2021, uh, again, in my pivot, you know, writing this book. I love that. We, we've been on a similar journey, uh, Steve, we, we, we did the same thing with the impetus of the pandemic and we went down that writing a book, uh, dark, dark alley, uh, writing a book is not an easy thing. So congratulations to you for getting this one out and for it not being your first rodeo. So you deserve, you deserve a little, you deserve a little applause for that. Just a little bit. <laughs> so the, the title of the book, the revelation conversation, that makes it sound like that's an actual thing. What is a revelation conversation? Well, the revelation conversation is a framework for a one-on-one -on -one conversation that a supervisor, a manager, a leader, a mentor has with a direct report. And it accomplishes three things. It reveals the totality of their job role. It connects their daily work activities to the higher purpose of the job role. And in doing so, it inspires greater employee engagement. <laughs> Do all managers know what the higher purpose of these job roles are? Because I struggle with that sometimes. They do not, uh, which is why the book's in three sections. The first <laughs> Is, is to reveal the totality of the job role. And before they can do that in chapter four, and they spent three chapters figuring <laughs> out what's the highest purpose of my job role? What's the highest purpose of the organization? What are our core values? Because most managers, most leaders, in fact, um, are completely unaware, not only of the higher purpose of the job role, but the mm -hmm. organization's purpose, whether that is couched 
as a mission statement, vision mm-hmm. statement, purpose statement, doesn't matter. Most are completely unaware of what that is, sadly. And, you know, I've, I've read statistics, depending on, on, on what you read, you know, 10% is the number they throw out. 10% of the executives can recite their organization's mission, vision, purpose <laughs> statement. In my own work, I worked with a client and I asked him prior to the, I was going to give a talk uh, on the topic of connecting to purpose at work. And I asked my client, how many of the senior leaders who are flying into Chicago for this meeting uh, will know uh, verbatim the company's one sentence corporate mission statement? And there were 222 leaders flying in. He told me most of them would. I said, okay. Okay. So as we got closer, I said, "Uh, it's a crazy thought. (laughs) <laughs> what if we, what if we did this? What if we had an index card at, at each place setting prior to my presentation? And I just projected on the PowerPoint slide behind me. And I asked them to just simply, you know, without consulting their smartphone, without conversing with the colleagues seated next to them, if they would just write out that one sentence corporate mission statement, we'll collect the cards, we'll attend to them later. So my client said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So we did that. When we <laughs> examined them afterwards, remember 222 people, there were four correct answers. Wow. There were dozens that were left blank or had a question mark. And at least one senior leader thought it was a trick question. They said, I don't believe we have a corporate mission statement right now. <laughs> and, and these are the top yeah. 222 managers in a sophisticated billion dollar technology company. Yeah. If they don't know, pretty safe bet people down down the chain don't know either. They don't. And, and that was really the observation that spurred me to write this second book. I, I love that. This, this notion of context, right? The compelling why. Um, wh- why do you think that's a hard lever towards engagement, right? What, what's the connection there between the context and the compelling why and my propensity to be engaged as an employee? Well... Um, front part of the book talks about revealing the total job role. I call it the anatomy of a job role. And if you, if you can picture, uh, you know, three circles, um, matching in size, slightly overlapping a Venn diagram with three circles, Mm -hmm. the bottom two circles of that Venn diagram would represent what I refer to as job functions. So that's the duties and tasks that are associated with a job role. So in other words, if if you possess adequate job knowledge and you can demonstrate sufficient job skills, then by extension, you are competent or you are capable to execute assigned job responsibilities. Sure. Most employees fall into that category. Um, They're competent. They possess adequate job knowledge. They can demonstrate sufficient job skills. In other words, they know what to do and they know how to do it. They're competent, they're capable. But there's this other dimension, that's the top circle. This other dimension of every job role, I refer to it as job essence. And that contains the single highest uh, priority of each job role, that's job purpose. Um, so, So you need to have job knowledge, you need to have job skills in order to be competent. So it's not zero sum, one or the other. You need to be competent. That's table stakes to earn a customer. But you also need to be aware of the higher purpose of your job role. That's job purpose. And that's reflected in the actions and in the behaviors that are purposeful, that underscore your organization's purpose, the purpose of your job role, your core values. And you reflect that in these actions and behaviors that elevate an experience from ordinary uh, to something more. Yeah, that that's a really powerful connection. Um, in the book, you, you mentioned that there are four questions that you can use to help employees define what their purpose is. Yeah. What are, what are those questions? And, and is this part of the revelation conversation that we're having this one-on-one convo or is this pre-work to that convo? Pre-work, good question. Very insightful. A lot of times those are kind of melded together, but you're absolutely right. Remember, there are three chapters that precede chapter four. And if you would like to jump ahead in books and just start at chapter four and get to the cornerstone uh, chapter of the book, you're, you're, you're not going to be successful because you're going to lack credibility during mm-hmm. the conversation. Okay. You know, when you get to the point where you talk about job essence, uh, you know, your, your uh, frontline hourly employee is going to say, what's that? They're going to be like, right. 
<laughs> and then if you do know what it is, if you do know, well, it's your single highest priority at work. They're going to say, well, what's that? What is that? <laughs> um, yeah. So you need to do this pre-work. And as a part of the pre-work, uh, yes, we introduced the four questions. The first question is simply, you know, what is the single highest priority of my job role? What's the purpose of my job role? And then the second question is, what values guide my actions and behaviors at work? And then the third question is, how do I manifest those values? What actions mm. and behaviors do I exhibit at work um, in support of those core values and that higher purpose? And then the fourth question is, what is my team's aspirational goal? Not KPI that we're looking at this month, not another important metric, uh, not a budget, not a quota, not productivity, but what is our North Star? What is our, our, our aspirational goal? We're never going to achieve it, but we are going to have enthusiasm, momentum, uh, movement, progress toward this aspirational goal. So highest priority of the job, values, how you manifest those values and what's the aspirational goal. I mean, there are two in there that, you know, I, I think a lot of leaders would struggle with defining for themselves, like, what is the highest priority of my job? Like, and you know, you've done a lot of work in the customer service space and we were talking in the pre-show and I was talking last night with a colleague about uh, his work with call center employees. So just taking, you know, a call center leader's perspective, what is the highest priority of a call center leader in their role? I mean, just, can you help us put some, some meat on those bones? Just making one up. Yeah. Um, well, it's not handle time. Mm. it's not first call resolution. Got it. You know, to use. Those kind, are easy to measure. <laughs> right. Right. But though that's not what we're talking about. Those, those are KPIs. So if I were the supervisor in that environment, I would ask, you know, the question, um, why is handle time important? Um, why is first call re resolution important? I would ask those questions and I would involve the frontline employee, if we hadn't articulated the higher purpose of the job role, I would ask them those questions. And then what they would probably say is something like, um, well, because guest satisfaction is correlated with handle time or first call mm -hmm. resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Why is guest or customer or client, we have different names for our customers. Sure. Why is customer satisfaction important? Well, um, you know, there's another KPI we look at, which is intent to recommend mm -hmm. and net promoter scores. Of NPS. The yep. Okay. Well, okay. So, so it's good to have satisfied customers so that we have loyal customers. Why are loyal customers important? And you just keep asking. Mm. And then, you know, well, gosh, loyal customers are important because uh, they return. They're repeat customers. And you can think, you know what, you're right. And according to Bain and Company, not only are they responsible for uh, repeat business and have higher return rates, they're also less price sensitive. Huh, that's a good thing. And they're also responsible for 80 to 90% of the positive word of mouth about our mm. company, about our organization, about our brand. And so now all of a sudden you've gone from handle time or first call resolution for the sake of customer service to my single highest priority at work is to create a promoter of our company Ooh. to create a promoter of our brand. And they say, well, <laughs> how do you do that? And then you, uh, this, is a, this is a wonderful conversation. It's probably the best use of a supervisor's time, that five minute conversation than anything else besides perhaps serving a customer directly. Mm -hmm. so, so essentially you espouse the mindset of a toddler and you just keep asking why. Well, why? Well, <laughs> Laurel's laughing because yeah. Because you, you're forcing them down a path that, that they don't have to go down in their normal workflow, right? Never has to, they, they can do, to your point in the beginning, they can do the tasks of their job. They can have competence at right. the task level without ever asking the bigger picture question. Right. They don't even think about it. And they don't think about it because their immediate supervisor doesn't think about it. And that's the right. shame. Well, and if you get to the top 200 leaders of the company and they don't know it either, um, nobody's talking about it. So Correct. if you work in an organization like that, you know, say I work in, in this technology company whose 222 leaders you put on the spot um, and I'm just a mid-level manager, how do we start that ball rolling? Like, how do I, get, how do I gain traction with my team? We, we talk about 
chunking things down here at Sky Team into into things that are inside your control circle. How do I do that if I'm in an organization that doesn't have values or nobody knows what the mission is? Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a name after the show in order to place a bulk purchase of the book. And then you could disseminate that to your mid-level management team. <laughs> That'll be the place to start. Uh, I love it. Um, no, no, in all seriousness, you, you begin, the book's in three sections, reveal the totality of the job role, connect uh, daily work activities, which are employees' real world of work, to this aspirational purpose of the job role and or organization. In some cases, they're identical. And then in doing so, you will inspire greater employee engagement by connecting their job to something more than transactions. Mm -hmm. Because these mid-level managers uh, who you're referring to, um, they too are highly competent. And right. they're, they're focused on what the, the management level above them is focused on. And guess what they're focused on? And it's not job purpose. They're focused on job functions. They're focused on competency. They're focused on productivity. They're focused on those KPIs. If you work in a contact center, it's things like handle time, first call resolution. If you're in a hotel, it's intent to return. Um, it's the customer effort score. These are the things they're focused on. They're focused on utilization reports, uh, financial reports, profitability, average rate in hotels, revenue per available room in hotels, but nobody by and large is talking about purpose. So the first thing you do is you talk to these mid-level managers about purpose and the higher purpose of the organization and job role. I love that. I, I love something that you said just sparked something in me. All of those metrics that you listed off are all lagging metrics. They're all things right. that we measure after the fact. Right, right. This connection to purpose yes. is a leading indicator. Yes. Yes. And that's a that's a hard shift because in the middle, right, as a mid-level manager, I, I'm my performance is typically being managed on shit that's easy to measure, right? Uh -huh. Because we we operate in a large complex organization and that's easy to do. Handle right. time, number of rings, right? I I can do all that. Um but right. connecting to purpose is different. And it's funny because it makes me think, you know, going back, I don't know, 15 years now to the Tony Shea Zappo days yeah. when he essentially told the frontline folks, figure it out, stay on the phone as long as you want. You have the latitude to solve that customer's problem because right. he had them focused on getting, building those brand ambassadors, those happy customers not dealing with the shipping issue or the shoes are the wrong size or whatever. Um, but that's a big, that's a big shift, a philosophical shift from, right. from he, lag to lead. Right. Tony Shea. Sorry, was, say that again. Tony Shea was ahead of his time. Um, he identified a purpose for Zappos, um, you know, before the, the book uh, deliver happiness was written. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it, it, I'm going back, but um, I, I believe it was to provide the best customer service possible. I think that was the overriding purpose of the organization Zappos, you know, even before they were uh, acquired by Amazon. Amazon, yeah. Um, and so, you know, if you establish that as the North Star and, and you have some guidelines or some riverbanks within which, you know, people operate, um, you'll have success. You know, even if somebody's on the phone for, eight or 10 or 12 hours, you know, that story at, 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 Zappos, right. at the contact center, they were providing the best customer service possible. Even if you quietly upgrade a shipment from ground to overnight, right. Um, you know, that's how you create a legion of marketers. And, and that's what Zappos was very effective at. I think it started with Tony Shea, certainly uh, championing that purpose to provide the best customer service possible. Yeah. Lori just said, sadly, Tony Shea lost his own purpose after creating an amazing company. Yeah. Super sad story yeah. about him and his journey. Um, but, but I love this idea of, of being able to connect a purpose from anywhere in the organization. I don't have to be the CEO, right? I can be in the middle of the 
stack and I can start this process. But when I get to the punchline of the joke, you know, I started my questions in chapter four, which is a bad idea. Um, uh, so I want to back up to chapter one, where you talk about two journeys. What are the two journeys in that book? Um, yeah, I do open with that because there is a tendency for executives and organizations to conflate a, a, a person's purpose in life with their purpose at work. Mm. And I think that, you know, there are exceptions, certainly. In the world of work that I come from at Marriott Hotels, if you're aspiring to align um, a frontline hourly associate, whether they work at the front desk or in stewarding or in housekeeping or another part of the hotel, um, if you're attempting to align their life purpose with the higher purpose of the organization or job role, that is an exercise in futility. And so I just make a distinction between those two. And I just submit that you should honor that fact that somebody's life purpose, his or her existential purpose in life is very private and very singular. And should, I think it's very naive and very arrogant to make the assumption that that in order for them to be a perfect fit job candidate for our organization, there needs to be alignment, especially one-to-one -one alignment between their purpose in life and our purpose as an organization. In other words, why our organization exists. And I think that is an exercise in futility and going down the wrong slippery slope. Right. Um Going back to the to the four questions, you know, the, the second one's about values. And, and that's a thing that we talk about here a lot, because I think all of us as internal HR folks have been involved in a values exercise at some point along our journeys. And certainly in my consulting career, I've I've helped organizations go through those visioning exercises around what what are we all about? Yeah. Um, and a lot of times. Right. I'll just put my cynical hat on. A lot of times they make for great poster wear. It's a great thing to hang in the lobby that to your point, 219 people don't know what it is. Um, how, if we, if we're living in an organization or in a space like that, how do we identify or connect to those values? If not at the organizational level, at least at the team level. Yeah. Um, now, there's an area to make a distinction between organizational purpose, which is why the organization exists, and core values that sort of underpin that overarching organizational purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, there, I think you, you will have success um, matching individual values of employees or prospective employees with those of the organization. Mm -hmm. And there are, I don't spend a lot of time on it in the book other than mentioning that, but there, there is, excuse me, as you're well aware, and as everyone on this call is, uh, on this podcast is well aware, there is predictive software mm -hmm. uh, from Gallup and others um, that will help you to identify, you know, alignment between your core values as an organization and an applicant's core values. Um, so I'd, I'd like to make that distinction. What I would say, and you referenced putting them on a poster, what I would say is that too many companies uh, create a set of core values that are what I would call imitative mm. core values. So they're, they're values like excellence, like right. customer service. Integrity. Like teamwork. <laughs> yeah, integrity. Um, quality. Those are all noble values. But if you just have if you just have the, the words and you put them on a coffee mug or a screensaver or in an annual report or on your website, on the about page, um, you know, that's ineffective. If you were to print that list out and, and likely if you were to print out the list of imitative values of your competitors and, and put them side by side for your employees, <laughs> right. they would not be able to detect or discern, you know, if you were to remove logos, they would not be able to discern which set of values was yours and which set of values belongs to your top competitor, <laughs> um, really, uh, because they're imitative. For and sure. So what becomes important for organizations in order to have an effective set of core values is to interpret what does that value mean to us? So we've got the value, 
but then we also have an explanatory sentence. It, it's short, it's pithy, it's one or two sentences that explain or that decipher, that interpret what that value means to our organization. And then to take it a step further and say, in addition to interpreting that that value, that core value, we're also now going to ascribe behaviors that demonstrate that value mm. in action in our organization. So now you've added some real teeth to make this uh, actionable in an employee's real world of work in terms of their actions, their behaviors, and their decision making, as opposed to just having you know this staid list of imitative values. Right. Um. Hey, Stace, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> because I would normally ask Lori this question because yeah. it's come up a few times and I think you know where I'm going to go here. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of core values exercises that have net less than desired effects. Uh, Stacy's organization went through a core values exercise that was pretty amazing in terms of identifying what they were and the stickiness and making them part of the culture. Stace, could you just give us like a two minute primer on what that was like and why it was so different this time for you? Yeah, absolutely. So coming together and bringing, bringing focus groups of people to talk about what is your experience like here at work is how we began and started developing those those words and what what does this mean for us? Um, taking it a step further to just what Steve described is we did put teeth in that and we got a group of people together, our core values committee, where they all worked really hard to develop, okay, what does it really mean when I'm behaving in the way this value describes? And we came up with four or five examples by um, value to put out there for people to relate to. Does this resonate with you in your job? Does this make sense as to um, this being an example of how you behave with um, in integrity is actually one of our values. Um, I know, I always make fun of that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, integrity, individuals, innovation, and impact. So um, that was huge. And it was something that we had never done before. And it was not an easy exercise. So it takes a lot of persistence. It takes a lot of minds to come together and think about that and develop it. But what was really effective for us in that was that this was created by a group of employees that were a mix of, of leaders and individual contributors, people that serve all different functions across the organization. So we were really getting a lot of diverse perspectives in all of this. Um, which is really important. And um, so that that proved to be great. And then eventually we got to developing behavioral interviewing questions that were aligned with all of our different values. So when Love we go that. out and we train our leaders and anybody that's on an interview team, if we're, we're looking for a values focused um, conversation here, here are some ideas on how you might be able to dig into how people actually might behave in this way at work. So um, yeah, does was that helpful? That was good. That was very sufficient. You did a nice job. Thank okay, you. Cool. I like the link to interviewing. <laughs> what was that, Steve? I like the link to behavioral interviewing. Yes. You know? Yeah. They Getting into that, it at the front end of the process, right? They say the best indication of future performance is past performance, and that's what you get with behavioral interviewing. And uh, you, you have the double bonus of having the interviewing questions crafted so that they align uh, with those core values. So Excellent. thank you, Stacey. I appreciate oh. that. And thanks for letting me put you on the spot. You you killed it. I appreciate sure. it. <laughs> so Steve, if we've, if we've got our values and, and we, we're starting to think about these things in a, you know, sort of a higher order purpose perspective, how do we connect everyday employees work activities to this organizational purpose? Well, first by articulating it, which is the four questions, and then revealing it um, so that it's not the best kept secret on the website or in the annual report, but making it known. And not just at you know mid-level management levels and above, <clears throat> but at every level of the organization, uh, making folks aware that this is the higher purpose of the organization, this is the higher purpose of your job role, and then you know discussing um, even in uh, team meetings, whether it's pre-shift or uh, 
taste panel, uh, department meetings, uh, whether they're formal meetings or informal meetings, discussing the actions and behaviors that we can practice that will um, enable us in our pursuit of this higher purpose. And so an example might be, um, let me think of uh, like, like a coffee shop. If, I'm, if I were the general manager of a coffee shop and I had a, a cadre of baristas, I might say, uh, you know, the single highest priority of your job role is to make a connection with the guest. So it's a fast paced environment. Our guests are in a hurry. We're usually in a hurry um, making these different espresso drinks. <laughs> but what we'd like to do is we'd like to make a connection. We'd like to slow it down even for a second in order to make a connection uh, with each guest. And that's your single highest priority. So remember earlier, we talked about competency. So that barista has got to know how to make the drink. You know, they've got a product knowledge. They've got to have the skill to make the drink. They've got to be able to deliver that. But most jobs are just about execution and delivery. You can't, you can't stop there. You have to think about purpose and contribution. So what is that uh, barista, um, what is he or she going to do differently when they know that the single highest priority of their job role is to make a connection with each guest? Well, here's what they might do. They may make a macchiato, and then as they hand the macchiato to the, to the guest who's waiting, they may say, um, did you know that macchiato is an Italian word that <laughs> means that means marked or stained? Your macchiato is marked with a teaspoon of milk. That's I didn't even know that. So, guys, you learned something new here today. Well, marked. Remember- Remember earlier, I said that that product knowledge is a job function. And so you might say, well, Steve, isn't that product knowledge to know that? Well, no, it's really not. Product knowledge is to know what goes in a macchiato yeah. and, in, and in what uh, proportions. Right. Um, it's to know things like temperature. Um, that's product knowledge. But what we're talking about with this macchiato illustration is something else. It's, it's, it's a level higher. I refer to it in my first book as unique knowledge. And this is always elective. It's volitional. Yeah. Um, making a macchiato is not elective. You have to do that. It's your job. In yeah. your job. But it's elective. It's volitional for me to go out as a barista and to be interested enough to pursue unique knowledge like this in order to, in order to contribute, really, uh, meaning and purpose at work beyond the transactional component of, you know, executing an assigned drink order. Right. I mean, that's no fun if you're just doing that all day. But this is this other dimension of a job role where that barista can exercise his or her individual flair and, and share um, this unique knowledge and, and, and make a positive lasting impression on that guest. And it's funny because as you're telling that story, it makes me think if, if my performance metric is time to deliver that beverage, well, I'm not going to tell a story because I got, I got more shit to do and I got more drinks to make. I'm not going to spend the extra 30 seconds that that takes because that'll blow my metric, right? It makes me think about, about recruiters. <clears throat> you know, I, I spent a long time doing recruiting and my, my HR brothers and sisters here will, will feel this pain. Uh, the number one metric for recruiters, uh, their performance is measured by time to fill, which is an absolutely horrid metric for quality of employee, right? Yeah. Um, I, I can I can hire shitty employees real fast, right? I, I can I can push them through the system to make sure that I meet my targets and get my bonus and whatever, but that doesn't serve the organization's higher purpose at all, right? So decoupling those things is important. And, you know, it, it's interesting when I, when I hear you tell the stories and I look at the framework, it makes sense, right? It's logical. It's, it's, there's, there's nothing in there that makes me go, well, wow, that's, that's too big a lift mm -hmm. in theory, right? In practicum, it's different because it's hard to get people off of that KPI diet that they've been on. It's hard to get people, mid-managers who are struggling with spans of control, right? I've got a client right now, 
um, that I'm coaching and, and her span of control is 18 employees, right? If all she did was have one-on-ones with her employees, she might be able to get that done in a week, mm-hmm. but she doesn't and she can't. And so she struggles with getting past, past the transactional. Do you have any advice or feedback for folks who, who read the ideas in, in this book and they go, Oh yeah, that makes so much sense. I really want to be able to do that, but they can't get out of their own way because of the volume of tasks that they have to deal with and are subsequently measured on. You know, that's tough. Uh, I know many readers are going to, start reading the book and not finish it. <laughs> it's, I, I know many readers are going to flip to chapter four um, to get at the Keystone chapter. I know that, you know, there are questions um, after each chapter that are designed to sort of bring you to a place where you could confidently, incredibly uh, deliver the Revelation conversation. And I'm sure many people will overlook those questions and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just move on to the next chapter. I know that that's going to happen. And so at the, at the I've been that person, frankly, mm-hmm. a number of business books. And so at the very end of the book, you know, I challenge the reader to simply start with one, write down the name or the initials of the person you have in mind, write down the place, write down the date, write down the time, all those things, according to James Clear, um, in his book, uh, Atomic Habits, oh, right, all yeah, of those yeah. things are going to help initiate this actually happening. And so when you make this date with yourself, you make this date with um, a subordinate whom you're going to have this conversation with, you're sort of establishing a covenant. So as long as you don't leave that blank, um, I like the odds of somebody um, you know, initiating a conversation. And it's like anything else. Once you do it, um, conversation two is going to be easier than conversation one. Conversation three is going to be easier than conversation two. But you've got to start somewhere. And also, James Clear is an advocate of uh, just spending 1% of your time. So if you look at a typical eight-hour workday, 1% of your time is uh, just under five minutes. You can (laughs) have the the revelation conversation in less than five minutes. So there's... There's really no reason if you choose to, regardless of how many people are you have as direct reports, that you can't have a one-on-one conversation in, in the uh, five-minute or less revelation conversation format over time. There's nothing that says you have to have it this week or by the end of next week or this period or this quarter, you know, depending on how many people are um, in, your, uh, in your sphere. Um, that's up to you. Awesome. So last question for me before I open it up to, to everybody here. Um, you mentioned that this book is a, is a sequel to, to the first book, um, delight your customers. Do we need to read them in that order? Are they connected in a meaningful way? Well, they're connected in a meaningful way. You don't have to read delight your customers in order to understand the revelation conversation. I will say that, um, this second uh, part of every job role, job essence, Uh, which contains job purpose, Um, job essence being the reflection of the higher purpose of the job role through actions and behaviors. The original book, uh, the subtitle of that book is Seven Simple Ways to Raise Your Customer Service from Ordinary to Extraordinary. And those seven simple ways are really seven exceptional customer service behaviors. Mm -hmm. I illustrated one earlier in the macchiato example, and that is to share unique knowledge. Um, but also in that book is express genuine interest, offer a sincere and specific compliment, uh, convey authentic enthusiasm, provide pleasant surprises, use appropriate humor, deliver service heroics, and mm. um, share unique knowledge. That's the seven. And so it would benefit you to the extent that it would provide a, a, a set of behaviors with a wealth of examples of how I've seen those used. Um, in my own training experience, what I've seen work. Um, so in that sense, it would support the second book, The Revelation Conversation, although The Revelation Conversation is about initiating these conversations 
with frontline hourly associates in particular in order for them to contribute. Um, here's some behaviors I could practice. Here are some actions that we can incorporate into the process in order to fulfill the higher purpose of the job role. As everybody knows, to the extent that I'm a part of that conversation, that's going to foster my personal commitment you know, mm. to this covenant that we've established. I love the usage of the word covenant. And, and I just want to make an obvious statement here. Despite, you know, your history and experience being in the hospitality and service industries, these, these, these ideas, these, these tenants, they translate to all walks of life here, right? This is any company anywhere in the world in terms of meeting and an exceeding customer desire. That's correct. Correct. Awesome. Awesome. This has been great. Um, I would do want to give a few minutes here. Does anyone have any questions they want to lob at Steve? He's given us a lot of, a lot of great stuff today. I love the framework. I love this idea of connecting to larger purpose. I mean, this, this, this is no easy lift um, in some organizations In some organizations, I, I think this is, this is a, it's nice to have a, a framework in which to, to operationalize these ideas in some organizations man, it's tough, right? We're, we're, we don't know what we're all about, what we're trying to be. Um, and we, or we've changed that idea every couple of years with leadership shakeups. So um, given all of these thoughts that we've talked about today, what questions do you have for Steve? And if anybody, has, if anybody has an operationalize or mm -hmm. systematize, how to operationalize or systematize this, we talked about behaviors, which are volitional actions can be mandated. And that's something that we can explore. I've got a couple of examples if we want to discuss that too. I, I hadn't thought of it until you mentioned uh, the word operationalize, but you're exactly right. All right, Laurie, go ahead. I'm getting a copy of your book, sending it to my boss. <laughs> <laughs> that's what no. I like to hear. Thank you. No, Lori works at an airline. so Yeah, I do. That's, that's my <laughs> primary job, but I'm on the training department and we're pumping out flight attendants as fast as we can and pilots and everybody is stressed big time. I had a, a, a very big wake up call yesterday and this, this kind of ties back in to, um, to the whole point of engaging with people and, and honestly, you know, caring about people. Um, I had a, a, a crew that we were working with and from another base and this one gentleman, Miguel, I speak Spanish. He was from Costa Rica. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, great to meet you. I'd heard about him. And we started talking. Well, it turns out he's a pilot. And I said, okay, what are you doing? You flight attendant going to be stepping stone to pilot, which a lot of people do. And he said, no, right now I'm taking a break. And I said, okay, what's, you know, tell me more about your story, which always is a great coaching question. Tell me more. Say more. And <laughs> yeah, we were at breakfast. He had some time and, um, his wake up call was the death of a friend of his who was a pilot who was forced to fly a plane in bad weather. Oh. And he said, you know what? The rules in Costa Rica are very different than the United States and Fair. I'm out. And he quit. He up and moved. And this gentleman, great guy, he speaks with absolutely no accent. I was really surprised that he has been only in the, in the States a couple of years. But he just, his journey, I mean, I, a number one, count your blessings, right? Um, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. But he said, you know, these kids here, they have no idea. Sometimes <laughs> our paycheck shows up, sometimes it doesn't. You know, I mean, he literally wow. went through you know, the working conditions or lack of, if you will, for where he was coming from. And he said, I, I do want to continue my pilot career. But for right now, he says, I am just taking a deep breath. I'm going to wait a little bit and then I'm going to regroup and then go back after it. But it was, he was dealing with life and death situations and, you know, we're not dealing with that. I used to own a cafe. I know what a macchiato is, you know, I mean, <laughs> but to inspire your people to do the right thing, to inspire them, to engage with them is so critical. Our company just started the on time machine campaign don't even get me started. I don't know what that, that means. <laughs> don't even get me started on it. But there are so many principles about what you're saying about how do you get people to get engaged and how do you get them to embrace the values 
frankly, it, you would probably ask everybody in our company and they, you would get a different answer from all 5,000 of them. Right. But at the exactly. end of the day, yeah. And, and at the end of the day, it's caring about that individual passenger on the plane. Well, I'm a firm believer in Herb Keller, the founder of Southwest Airlines. Mm-hmm. He said, take care of your people. They will take care of the passengers. I take care of my teams and I'm, <laughs> I love to bake. I bring food and <laughs> food is powerful. My, my mom has a, a banner in her kitchen that says, love people, cook them tasty food. And I really believe that that's such a great opportunity to, you know, breaking bread together with people, whether it's a cookie or whatever it is. But even our cleaning crews in Denver, I, Moses, Moises, um, I have developed a relationship with one of the head cleaners on our cleaning crews. I'm like, Moises, you guys are awesome. I love what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And encouraging your other team members, no matter what they do, if they're cleaning toilets, it doesn't matter. Know their names. And I forget who the CEO was that stressed that. Know their names, but thank them. And I recently had an encounter with our CEO and he did neither of those things. Oof. And he, he kind, of, kind of losing your way, right? Lost an opportunity. Yeah. So simple things. And that's my point. Simple things really matter. And those, the smallest action can create such a beautiful environment for people to really want to step up and to, you know, when they know somebody cares about them, um, it, it goes way, way beyond that, that simple action. So that's a great question, Lori. So Steve, as a manager of these people trying to get them to connect to purpose, do I have to care about them? Uh, yes. <laughs> I <Thank you>. mean, <laughs> I mean, just asking the the sort of silly question, but I work, I work with a lot of technology companies and you know, there are people out there who think I don't need to be friends with these people. Mm. I just need to work with them. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and, and I, str- I struggle with that because, you know, the basis of all the work that we do at Sky Team is all about the quality and depth of the relationships you have at work. Um, so last, last parting thought here from Steve, um, how does that factor in? I mean, do I have to care about these people and, and why is that important? Yes. And you don't have to take my word for it. I was on a call earlier. No, I'm sorry. I was on a call last week. Um, it was Gallup's call. Mm. Uh, some of these folks may have been on that call too. Um, and I'm trying to think of the name. Oh, they, they released their state of the global workplace, 2022 report. Oh, on the I call. love that report. Yeah. It's like 170 pages. So I printed one for me and one for a client in new Orleans and I went through it um, maybe on a Friday and, and I took some notes. Um, and one of the things I wrote down was, they talked about, you know, the influence of your immediate supervisor or someone's boss. And they said a manager's effect on a workplace is so significant that Gallup can predict 70% of the variance, you know, the difference or the inconsistency in a team's engagement just by getting to know their boss. Hmm. Fascinating. So if Gallup gets to know their boss and detects that he or she really doesn't care, uh, which you can't mandate caring, you know, right. that's behavior, um, you can't mandate it. It's, it's elective, it's volitional, um, it's a choice. And if you don't care, uh, according to uh, Gallup, they can detect that and then they can predict that you're not going to have success with your team. The other thing is the revelation conversation, this framework that we discussed, um, it's going to be, you know, impotent if the supervisor or the manager or the leader lacks credibility uh, with that frontline hourly employee or that subordinate. It's going to lack credibility. It's just like having a an organizational purpose that lacks credibility. Sure, people aren't going to buy in, and so people right. aren't going to listen uh, to that manager, that supervisor, and they're not going to act on on his or her suggestions for that very reason. Love it, love it. You heard it from Steve. You've heard it from Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, Adam Grant. Right? They they're all saying the same things around your engagement, your level of care, your level of, of intent. Um, 
it matters. So Steve, how do we find out more about you? Where do we go? If we want to buy the book, give us the, uh, how to find Steve details. Well, you bet. Um, you can find me at my website, which is Steve Curtin, C U R T I N.com. And you can find the book wherever books are sold, uh, Amazon and elsewhere. And the title of that book is the revelation conversation. Inspire better employee engagement by connecting to purpose. I love it. Big ups for Steve for being here. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. We're going to get into our, our funny things, good feels, cocktails, and get on out of here because it's uh, Av's playoff game tonight. And uh, I am not going to be waiting around here. Oh, hello, <laughs> Lori, Lori's friend. Lori's got a friend. Look at that. <laughs> Dieter, my furry son. Yeah. <laughs> so, Funny things. I'm going to need somebody to come off mute and be my laugher because Lori's not here. So anybody that thinks any of this shit's funny, come off mute so I can hear you laugh. So there you go. Thanks, Lori. The other Lori. The other Lori. <laughs> funny thing number one, the prophecy is fulfilled. <laughs> Very good. Very nice. Thanks. I'll um, be in Montana next month. I'll see that. This this next one might be relevant to you as well. Staying on the animal tip here. I don't know what he's going through, but I feel him. Amazing. <laughs> uh, moving from animals to the occult, what could possibly go wrong with a Roomba and a Ouija board carpet? <laughs> Peter hates the Roomba, by the way. <laughs> uh, this funny thing made me laugh because I've written this book report. Uh, this is me in high school writing an essay about a book I haven't read. The important thing is to realize what's important. <laughs> Thank God for book jackets. Exactly. <laughs> and it wouldn't be a bartender without a slightly dirty one. Uh, this is out of the mouths of babes. My son, seven, has discovered D's nuts jokes. And it's all he says now. Everything is D's nuts. He simply can't stop. I asked him where he heard that joke, and he made me promise that if he told me, he wouldn't get in trouble. I agreed. So he leans in and whispers, D's nuts. <laughs> uh, which I thought was, I mean, that's master level gamesmanship right there. Totally. All right. T today's good feel story. Steve Hartman, he's going to get you. Steve Hartman this morning has the story of a high school graduate's dream come true. Mike and Tracy Tebow always believed that time heals all wounds, but that belief faded last fall when their 18-year-old son Jake was paralyzed in a hockey game. And you get me every time, buddy. Oh, Eric. Awesome. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Today's semi-quarantine cocktail is I'm Tom. I'm here to fix your AC. It's a riff on the Tom Collins. You're going to need two ounces of gin. And did you know that today is National HVAC day. I Who didn't know. Who knew? Need a little bit of lemon juice. If your AC has ever gone out, you know, not all heroes wear capes, my friends. A little bit of sugar or simple syrup and some club soda to top it off. That's your I'm Tom here to fix your AC. I am super grateful for all of you people. Thanks for being here today. Thanks to Steve Curtin for being here today. It's been a fun day. We'll be back next week. And uh, until then, go Avs, everybody. We'll That's see you next time. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a good time and learned a thing or two at today's happy hour, please share it with your friends. If you want to join our tribe, head on over to skyteam.cloud forward slash TCB or email us at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team dot com. Thanks again. And remember, you've always got friends at the corporate bartender.